photo work is really my last ditch, desperate effort to get people to care about nature. And the only way I knew how to do it was just through photographs. Used to be you'd go in the field and you'd wait for a long time for that special moment in nature. Now we make that special moment happen. Is the tiger in? Yeah. She's in there? Yes. Holy cow. Wow, she's big. She's massive and beautiful. Okay. Is the short light on the softbox, is that pointed at the tiger? Now is it? Yeah. All right. Is the light pointed at the tiger still? Yeah. OK, and now just, if you can summon the nerves. All right. Here go ahead and try it again with your light. Real slow, real slow. Man, that looks good. That's one of the nicest tiger pictures I've ever got. Look at that, just in a little dappled light. Looking beautiful. The eyes are all glowy, the whiskers stand out. They say people will only save what they love, and they won't love it if they've never even met it. So that's where the art comes in. Every animal we shoot for the photo arc represents a new opportunity to get them to care. That's a tremendous thing. I grew up in a middle-class suburban neighborhood in a town called Ralston, Nebraska. My parents both cared about nature a great deal. For my mother, it was her birds and flowers in her backyard. My father took me hunting and fishing for years. Every weekend, we could go, just about. This is when I learned how to take pictures with a camera. I used a tripod, took my own picture. It's with my dad. For us, bird hunting and fishing was just getting out and looking at otter playing along the banks or deer or whatever birds we saw overhead, like kingfishers and, and ducks and herons. My father always used to say, it doesn't matter whether we catch any fish or not. It's we're spending time in the boat and we're seeing a lot. I think that's why I care so much about nature today. My mother, when I was a little boy, gave me a Time Life book called The Birds. And in it was a section on extinction. And in that section was a picture of Martha at the Smithsonian, stuffed, after she died. She passed away in 1914 at the Cincinnati Zoo. There were billions of that bird at one time, and they had been market hunted down to that single bird who died alone in her cage. And I couldn't get over that. A black field with white letters that said extinct in all caps. My father used to talk about it as we'd drive around the countryside. He'd say, you know, I remember when this was virgin prairie, or I remember when this woodlands, we used to hunt quail in there, it's all gone, it's all been bulldozed. So we were very aware of it. My father made us aware of it. Me with a camera for some reason, although I wouldn't really appreciate cameras and use them until many years later when I was in college. Photography to me was really amazing. I took pictures of whatever general assignment things I had to, first for the Daily Nebraskan, the college newspaper. Could be a preacher that came to campus. It could be an arm wrestling tournament. Could be an exotic livestock sale on the edge of town where they sold llamas and zebras. And I knew right then, as soon as I started getting into that heavy, that's what I was gonna do. When I graduated college, I worked at the Wichita Eagle in Wichita, Kansas for six years. It was a hard job, but it paid off, you know. I finally got the attention of Geographic after about six years. I sent clips in from the newspaper. I would wait every three months or so if I got something good in the newspaper. And then these three pictures, these three pictures were the kind of things that I think got Geographic's attention because they're in subtle light. There's a moment going on in each one, and they tell a story. Two pheasant hunters cresting a hill with the storm that's just ended. Cattle watching a pasture fire burn. 
And then this one, this is a, a thunderstorm that was coming in near the town of Bazaar, Kansas, where I used to go fish in the Flint Hills. So I went and got my camera and a tripod and got one lightning bolt. These are the types of pictures that got me hired with National Geographic. For the first few years, I mainly did, you know, kind of general human interest stories, looking for the fun stuff. And I would find things that I thought were weird or different or funny, and that that was something Geographic was looking for. So I'm lucky I had a sense of humor. That really, really helped carry the day and get me established there. It really came to be that Geographic started getting me more and more conservation stories, and then exclusively conservation stories. And sometimes you can get a little humor in those, too. This is a spectacle. There's probably uh, four to 5,000 walrus down below me. It's just an amazing sight to see them all piled in. They're just packed in there, you know? You know, they say walrus can live about 40 years and that they weigh up to 3,500 pounds. The only thing I know for sure is that they're really stinky. This is excellent, looking straight down on them. It's just amazingly cool. The whole trick is getting here, that's the whole deal. Just showing up for work on time. Shooting in the wild is kind of a challenge because the animals don't subscribe to National Geographic or care to have their picture taken, so it's always really tough. Well, this is stupid. Well, I thought I could be a, a great white hunter and just have them drop me off next to a herd of muskox out in the middle of nowhere. And they let me out, and the muskox ran off, and that's it. So I'm going to be just sitting here looking at myself for three hours. This is a disaster. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Always in the heat, always fighting bugs. Oh, ouch. I got to do a close-up of that one. That's one of the stinging ones. Golly. I think I swallowed one of our bug friends here. That's the mark of a professional. Swallow your subjects. See how they're rubbing their heads? That's bad. It means they're really irritated. This is day two, trying to get the macaws in flight. This is my fourth day up here. Uh, this is uh, day six up here. And uh, they, uh, I think they're mocking me. Uh-oh. Sometimes you just have to keep getting back up you want to get the picture. I cared a lot about individual species, but I never saw, until that time, the types of things that really could doom them. That really changed my thinking. This kind of pollution, this kind of devastation. Eventually, you know, it wears on you and you think, everybody's pretending like this is okay. But I don't think it is okay. And I think it could be a lot better. If you're a, a thinking person, you have to think, I could, I could maybe do something about this. This is kind of important to let people know about. I don't think they'd want this to happen, you know, over and over again, would they? I, I always thought, and I still kind of think, if I just show people what's going on, they'll want to fix this problem. This is a mess. This is terrible. When you're trying to get across complex thoughts and complex issues in a single still photograph, that's very hard to do. I tried doing it with a northern spotted owl took him to a clear cut and, and lit him to show that the owl needs woods. And I did the same with a gopher tortoise along the edge of a highway with a logging truck going by behind. It's all about telling the story of wild animals in a way that hopefully gets the world to stop and pay attention. 
You have to figure out a way to make endangered species and extinction entertaining, interesting. You start out with a grabby picture or two or three, pictures that ask more questions than they answer, and then you get them in and they start reading about the subject, they start learning. story that the editors at National Geographic like enough to publish, that's, man, that's planting your flag on Mount Everest. That is hard to do. I'd be gone weeks at a time. There were no cell phones. I'd just go someplace, and I'd come back six weeks later. And I'd be all cut up or bit up or have some weird tropical disease, and I'd rest up till the next time to go. So I was up doing a story on Alaska's frontier on the north slope of Alaska, and Kathy said, get home if you want to stay married. So I did. And then a few weeks later, she found a lump in her breast and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. So that marked the end of me gallivanting around the world. It started the photo arc eventually, in a roundabout way. So Kathy was down and out for almost a year with chemo and radiation, but she came through it. And it's been 13 years and she's still healthy. She made it through. And in that year that I was home, I, I discovered that um, you know, maybe I should sit and think about what I was doing. And I would just wander around the house, and we had a lot of prints up of Audubon's work, mainly of birds, a lot of them that have since gone extinct. And I just remember looking at them and thinking, you know, that guy gave everything he had to that project, documenting the birds and mammals of North America. And here I am admiring his work to this day. He gave his full measure of devotion to this one thing. I thought, that's for me. If I could concentrate on one thing, maybe I could get something to stick that would get people to care about nature. So I started doing those portraits. I went to the Lincoln Children's Zoo on the days Kathy started to feel better, about a mile from my house, and photographed a naked mole rat on a white cutting board in the zoo kitchen. Naked mole rat on white, that was the first thing I shot. In that first picture of the mole rat, we can see a little bit of his personality. They're all about teeth. They don't really see very well. They're hairless. They're a very unusual little mammal. You can't help but look at it and kind of get a kick out of it. Then I started just photographing whatever they had, and pretty soon I had about every species there. And then I went to the Omaha Zoo, which is one of the world's great zoos just an hour away, and photographed a lot of what they had. And then went to Kansas City, Denver, Tulsa, Sioux Falls, Des Moines, Oklahoma City, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio. I just started going out and out and out. He's hanging on my finger. Ouch. Ouch. There you go. There you go. That is a cool behavior, isn't it? It's just a matter of going from zoo to zoo, aquarium, aquarium, around the world, convincing them to allow me to photograph what they have. They are the keepers of the kingdom now. For many of the species, these animals only exist in zoos. If it weren't for zoos, these animals would be extinct now. They would be gone forever. This is my one chance I'm ever going to have to do this bird. I never thought I'd get this, the Madagascar fish eagle. It's been on the brink of extinction for years, and this is just really cool. They will prep off exhibit spaces with black and white backgrounds so that when they shift the leopard in. It's already black, it's already white. The animal's used to it. They've been eating lunch in front of this background for a week. Oh man, that's nice. We shift the animal into a little cloth shooting tent. Yeah, he's fast, he's like grease lightning. Or a bigger tent, or a big room. Or we bring a giraffe-sized black velvet drape, and the giraffe comes into the room, and, it, and he fits on it. And we'll work in the wild a little bit sometimes, too. I think we got it. Somebody's collecting insects from an area. We'll photograph a lot of those animals, too. Dung beetles! I am super excited about this. Holy cow, it's massive. Yeah. This pile of poop makes the whole hike worthwhile right here. Really? Oh, God, yes. This is fantastic. Oh, good. They're just beautiful. They're like little gems. I'm totally excited. Dung beetle photographer, that's me. Yep. 
Wie Zeichen. We have a very limited amount of time. We have a lot of animals to get to. We want to get these things done quickly so the animal can be on its way back to its enclosure. I'm just thinking about getting eyes in focus, a clear view of the body, and then a tight shot of the head. And then do it again on white after you've done it on black. So we have the animal already in there. And we're going to switch background colors without touching the animal. We're going to pull that black out slowly, leave the animal right there. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. It gives us a different look, and some animals look better on one color than another. It's just a very clean, simple way of looking animals in the eye without distraction and really seeing what they look like. A lot of these animals, they live their lives in muddy water or in the soil or high up in the trees. So you never see them unless you were to crack them out and put them on these backdrops. The other nice thing about these backdrops is it's a great equalizer. A mouse is the same size as an elephant in these portraits, so they all have an equal voice, and a lot of them need it. Many of these animals have never been photographed even alive before, so this is their one chance to really speak and have their stories told. Look at how awesome biodiversity is. You literally have buckets full of different types of chameleons. Isn't that amazing? We use these lights that are pretty powerful, but the burst is short. just a thousandth of a second or less. And that gives us great depth of field. In most of the pictures, every hair is in focus, every fish scale is in focus from the eye on back. So that's why the pictures look the way they do is because we put a lot of light on these animals for a very brief instant. Oh, that's a good one. See, I could spend an hour just on that one. That's really the point of the photo work, to get people to fall in love with all creatures, no matter whether they are big and orange with black stripes or small and brown. They all have value. They're all honed by millions of years of evolution, all equal, even cockroaches. Every animal, I'm amazed how they're built. You know, not one feather too many or too few. They're all built precisely for their environments, or they wouldn't have made it through time. The other thing that I notice over and over again is how smart these animals are. They're looking at me very curiously, whether it's a fish or a lizard or a snake or birds or mammals. They all have a lot of intelligence, and they, to me, they all have a basic right to exist. When you're photographing something you know is going to go extinct, it's a weight. It's a very heavy weight. You know that you have to do a great job because this is its only chance to have its story told, more than likely. You hope that you do it justice. I often sit and think, I'm the witness here. Will I remember what this animal was like? Will I be able to capture even a fraction of how magnificent it is and how tragic it is to lose it? Can I convey that? One of five left in the world. Oh, just five left. So, you know, it'd be easy to get depressed, but I don't. I just get angry, and it's my job to get across to the world that this is a epic tragedy. Every time we lose even something as small as a frog or a mouse, it's epic in scale and wrong. That's what drives me. That's what keeps me leaving home and will continue to drive me until I'm done. I think the strength of the ark lies in the mass or the volume of it. That's when you can really see what biodiversity looks like. That to me is where the juice of the photo work is, is in seeing how much there is out there that we've never paid attention to. That, that to me is very intriguing. You know, a little bit more than 8,500 species now in the ark. The world has between 12,000 and 15,000 species captive at zoos and aquariums. So we're well past halfway now. But it is a lot of work.
I'm seeing the needle move now with the photo arc because so many people are interested in it. People are paying attention now in ways that they didn't before. These pictures have been projected onto the Vatican and the Empire State Building and the UN Building. This is the best time ever to be in conservation, I think, because we can reach the whole world directly. A hundred million people that follow National Geographic social media, a hundred million people can see that animal and really learn about it and learn what the zoo's doing to save it. That's powerful. That's great. I'm an impatient guy. I see the world headed towards 10 or 11 billion people. Will we smarten up fast enough to save the remaining habitats we have left and the species within? It's a race. I don't know. But the photo arc is the best thing that I knew how to do. This is about saving life on Earth. That's what this is about, plain and simple. And there is no time to lose. So if there's one question that encapsulates the photo arc, it's this, do we care?